lecture in our Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Today, uh, we are honored to have Burkhard Tendrich, who is the uh, General Manager of Byte Communications in North America. Byte Communications is a leading technology public relations firm, and they have offices worldwide. Um, uh, Burkhard is uh, responsible for all of the United States operations. Prior to uh, his role with Byte Communications, he had uh, executive vice president type of roles, similar areas at Siebel Systems. He also has a master's and PhD from um, Bonn University in Germany. Uh, today what he's going to talk about is the role of the media, the role of public relations in the development of new firms in venture development. So with that, let's welcome our speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you. Let me kick this off by um, asking you a quick question. Who's familiar with this penguin? Great, most of you. What I think is interesting about this penguin is that unlike creatures like the, the Budweiser lizard or the Energizer bunny, this animal, the Linux penguin, has actually been created with zero advertising budget. Um, in fact, the whole Linux brand, a technology brand, a major worldwide technology brand, was created largely through media, through blogs, through social communities. Um, and it, it kind of made sense because Linux isn't really owned by any particular company. So nobody in the beginning really thought about putting advertising dollars behind it. Now it's kind of become a very interesting showcase for creating technology brands through public relations. What Linux really is and, and has been is what I would call a media virus, a topic that is so important and in many respects so right and so timely that the media and publics will just pick up on it almost automatically. You know, what a media virus needs is a, is a strong antagonist and in Microsoft, Linux had exactly just that. So with this little mini case study, um, thank you for um, having, giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, as Professor Seed, who said, I work with Byte Communications. We are a leading technology agency. We work with established companies here in the Valley or anywhere in the US and also in Europe. And we also work with many new ventures. We help companies launch and, and build their brand through public relations. Now, why are we interested in, in doing PR and why should you as a former entrepreneur be interested in public relations? There are really three main reasons. The first one, what public relations does for you, it informs audiences about the company, the product, services, its executives. But informing is really just the beginning. What's almost more important is that it has the ability to influence, influence key stakeholders, decision makers, investors, analysts, financial as well as industry analysts, and eventually customers. And the outcome of this you know, is that public relations can shape market opinion. I'll talk in a minute about why, according to my experience, this works really well public relations as opposed to, um, for instance, advertising, in particular in technology. Okay, now it's about time to talk about what is public relations. And there are many, many um, definitions out there. I picked up on one which uh, I think describes it really well. It's communication with various sectors of the public to influence their attitudes and opinions in the interest of promoting a person, product, or idea. Now, let's be a little more hands-on. What does this actually mean? You know, if, if you're working for a technology startup, why would you care and how um, would your firm actually interact with, with public relations vehicles. Probably the most prevalent and in many respects a very important mechanism of public relations is media relations. According to estimates, about 70% of all stories that you read online, read in the newspaper, read in business publications, or, or watch on the news have been placed by the public relations functions of, of organizations. 
And uh, I know as a fact that in technology, the percentage is, is certainly very, very high. Linux is almost an example to the opposite. So um, press relations, you know, let me just give you a very simple uh, example of how it works. In fact, uh, last week, Professor Sidhu and I had the opportunity to sit down with uh, a reporter from the Associated Press. Associated Press is a wire, um, public, wire uh, news service, if you like, that distributes, in fact, sells articles then to, to any media organization that wants to buy them. We had lunch and we talked about the center and the importance of um, you know, the, the program that all of you go through. And as course of the conversation, the reporter asked Professor Sito for his opinion on a little program that was going on in San Francisco. And there are people working with 10-year-old students on a week-long MBA where little kids present their uh, business plan ideas to, to VC audiences and to company executives. And Professor Sidhu had a very good opinion on this. And uh, in fact, when the story ran on Friday, his quote and his association with, with the center was, was in this story. And the story ran in about 150 publications um, when we tracked it on Google. You know, really, all the, the leading dailies, some of the you know, online, of the, uh, online version of the TV news stations had picked it up. So really with one meeting, we were able to get real, real nice um, exposure for um, the leader of the center and really get people to think about the type of education that's going on here. Product promotion for, for you as future technology entrepreneurs. This is probably an area where public relations will touch you um, right away. You, you, know, you work with people, work very, very hard to develop a product. It's ready. You even start selling it to some customers who you've worked with very closely throughout the process. But then, how do you get sales leads? How do you get the word out? And very few technology companies, especially in this day and age, really have the budget to go out and, and buy Super Bowl ads or even ads in, in online publications and, 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 tra and technology trades. So a very effective mechanism is to start engaging with target media, and I'll talk a little bit more about who target media is, but you know, for, for many software hardware products, it could be publications like CNET, it could be Computer World, it could be certainly Business Week and others. So um, what, what you would really do in order to promote products is focus on those publications that write about product innovations, and that way you get the word out about your product in, in a very price effective way. I'll just comment briefly on the other ones up there. Um, because they're actually more applicable to more mature companies. Technology startups don't really need to worry too much about corporate communications, which would be financial communications. Um, it would be talking about campuses, executive stock options, all these topics. Similar with public affairs, many technology companies, mature technology companies now, have um, uh, public affairs and also lobbying functions that, that focus a great deal on Washington DC and on sh helping shape technology policy. Um, employee and investor relations, is, you know, it's, it's, it's a big function for um, larger companies. They really need to make sure that the employees, employees know what's going on. And certainly investor relations, almost a separate function, you know, engaging very much with uh, financial stakeholders. Last one is crisis management. And crisis is always when public relations becomes a legacy rather than an asset. Let's just say you have developed this first product and uh, you, know, you pitched it to a reporter to do a product review. And the product review comes out rather negative. What do you do then? Well, then you shift into crisis mode. And uh, you start thinking you know, with, with your management team, with your marketing team, and, and with your public relations team about what, what you can do now. Crisis communications, perfect example would be the, um, the issue that Hewlett Packard had last summer about um, uh, the, the board um, essentially researching telephone records of board members and journalists. That was so the perfect example of a major public relations crisis they had. What I have encountered a lot in talking to young entrepreneurs about marketing companies and marketing products is that the distinction between advertising and public relations wasn't really all that clear. Um, 
What's very important to understand is that public relations is not a guaranteed exposure that you can purchase contractually than something that you will get. That's really what advertising is. You can go out there and buy an, an ad. You can buy an online ad on a, on a social website, on a technology website. You can buy a one page ad in a technology publications or in Business Week. And of course, you can buy what actually technology startups did during the boom a few years ago, that they purchased very expensive Super Bowl ads up to a million dollars. So talking about the differences, I think this little table here helps me conceptualize in advertising. The good news is the control is superb. You know, since you purchase the exact words, the exact images, the sounds that are being put out there, you have 100% control. That's the problem with public relations. You really don't. You, know, you can go out there, talk to media. You can give your first product that you've worked on so hard and poured so much time and money in. You can give it to, as a review unit to a journalist, and the journalist may write something very bad about it. This is something that public relations tries to control, but the control in PR is significantly lower than advertising. Credibility, however, it's flip-flopped because in credibility advertising, as you, know, you would probably agree, um, either you tune out, uh, you, know, you, you listen to advertising if it's, if it's fun, if it's entertaining, if it's informative, but you know, most of the time you know, we all use our TV to just fast forward and many of us do this as they go through, public, um, to, through publications or you know, social websites. Public in, in public relations, the credibility is much higher because most public relations vehicles, in particular, so media coverage, went through an editorial filter. You, know, you, as the company spokesperson, had to convince the reporter that it was important. The reporter had to convince her editor, and the editor had to convince her editor-in-chief that this is actually you know, a meaningful and a true and a relevant statement. And that translates then into um, higher credibility. You read, about, you read about a product, you read about a technology company, and certain third parties weigh in, an analyst or an academic or a customer, who, by the way, in most cases have been placed there by public relations, but they weigh in as independent third parties and, and really endorse the message that you have given to a reporter. And you look at costs, and needless to say, the costs for advertising tend to be very high, and for public relations, they can be very, very low. You can do amazing things, especially as a startup, and especially in technology, on a shoestring budget. It's more difficult if you have you know, consumer products and you need to just go out and reach tens or hundreds of thousands of people. In technology startup, frequently your audiences are much smaller, and they can more equally be captured. More about that in a minute. So sort of as a, as a quick um, so summary of this section, yes, public relations can build awareness, but it really just starts there. And it does all the other things um, listed here. The real goal is to change behavior, you know, to build credibility, and to influence opinion leaders. But there's a number of things that public relations cannot do. And this is also something that's very important to understand as you engage in public relations activities. You, know, you cannot kill off the com competition. That's not going to happen. Um, you cannot eliminate other opinions. You, know, the, you can say great things about your company, about your product, but some people may just not like it or may have any motivation to uh, speak up and, and argue against it. And there's little you can do about it. And it's certainly, and this is very important in sort of the post-Enron days, it, it cannot compensate for bad decisions, corrupt practices, and, and also for weak marketing. Another confusion that many people have is what's the difference between publicity and public relations? And to me, what it really comes down to is the notion of strategy. Publicity, which is much more used in publications like this and you know, with entertainment celebrities, is just basically just give me visibility for anything I do. 
This could be Britney Spears checking into rehab is, is public relations and got amazing, amazing headlines. Public relations is really more about looking at a goal that you have, figuring out a strategy, and then certain tactics underneath it. So just briefly on the notion of strategy, that, you know, th there's a lot of confusion out there. What is actually a strategy? And I, I looked up some on the web. The third one is the one that I personally like. It's really a method for obtaining a goal. You know, so you know what the goal is. You know where you want to go. But you really need to figure out how you want to get there. As this image here implies, strategy is frequently about winning and losing. As technology entrepreneurs, you will be working in very competitive markets. And a high percentage of, of startups won't make it. And others will be very, very successful. And I'm sure you'd all agree that you want to be on the side of those who will be very successful. Having a good marketing strategy and a good public relations strategy will be part of that. This is a somewhat of an, um, if you like, a, um, an edgy um, definition of public relations. I got it from a website that is, uh, really focuses on political activism. But it, this is actually widely used in technology marketing. You know, public relations being war, being about winners and losers. The winners gain public media and regulatory acceptance and support for their products, services, and organizations. And the losers, even if the technology is superior, and there are many, many examples out there, you know, they may see their products, services, and organizations you know, being heavily criticized and not being able to you know, make it through to a successful commercial introduction. In a few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about some case studies that I hope will bring out some of these concepts discussed. Before we go there, I want to point to the fact that public relations is very much in transition. And as a result of you know, what's coined Web 2.0, if you like, social media, the ability of anybody to influence and interact with anybody, a number of things have changed. And first one to point to is really the decline of mainstream media. If you look at viewership of um, news telecasts, if you look at newspaper subscription rates, if you look at how thin some of these technology trade publications have become, not as a function of the bust a few years, but as a function of the fact that many of the advertising dollars have gone and the readership is just not that interested anymore. You see that as a marketing strategist, you need to evolve your thinking about how you can reach your audiences. Again, the decline of traditional media, and don't get me wrong, traditional media is still very important and will continue to be very important for a long time. At the same time, massive changes are underway. This is really the result of the rise of social media. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys all know MySpace. You all you know, have probably commented on the blog, or you may have your own blogs. And you're keenly aware of some of the very influential blogs and social media vehicles that are out there shaping opinion and um, enabling participation. The chart on the right is uh, taken from Technorati, a blog search engine I'm sure most of you know. And uh, it just indicates how quickly you know, new blogs are being developed. And this is now, you know, there are millions and millions of blogs out there. And granted, most of them are very, very unimportant. Most of them have a you know, readership of five. Um, I, you know, I saw bumper ads, nobody reads your blog. And I think a lot of that is true. At the same time, some of them have become very, very important. Anybody here familiar with the theory of the long tail? Has anybody heard about it? Great. So summarize briefly, the theory of the long tail was developed by Chris Anderson, the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine over in San Francisco. 
And essentially what it says is that within marketing of uh, online marketing of products, there now is a long tail of sales. And what this means is if you look to the left of the curve, this would signify the high volume products that Amazon sells, that uh, Netflix rents, or that iTunes downloads, or is being downloaded from iTunes. The very popular books, DVDs, and songs. And this is where online merchants compete with brick and mortar shops. Because the brick and mortar shops, they have just enough space and uh, enough you know, logistical capacity to keep a certain number of books, DVDs, um, or records in the store. They cannot really cater as well to what Chris Anderson has coined the long tail, and that is this almost endless curve of lower selling, lower volume selling um, products. He stated that every song on iTunes has been purchased at least once. And what that means is Apple made a, pro a profit of that one song. Every movie on Netflix has been rented, and Amazon is, is selling the most random books. And, and they may only sell 20 of them or 100. But the way the business model works, they can still make money of it, and so can the publishers. So if you think about it, the long tail can very much apply to media, to social media, as well as to conventional media. So this is really the, sort of the, the mainstream media, the Wall Street journals and, and the business weeks, et cetera, and also some of the super successful social sites. But then there's a long, long, long tail of, of blogs, of specialist sites that have very low readership, but very targeted readership. You know, my wife, coincidentally, writes a blog which is somewhere here on the long tail. She has several thousand readers every day, and she has advertisers who know that they can reach very targeted audiences on her blog. The same is true for many technology vehicles. There are blogs out there that, that deal with, I don't know, very, very specialized technology issues. And what you, as a technology entrepreneur, would want to do is make sure you don't just talk to anybody who may or may not be interested in what you do, but that you really find the right vehicles, social media or not, anywhere on the long tail, to the far left and to the far right. So what happens now is, because of the long tail of media, advertising is moving away from conventional media, at least some of it is, into the long tail. And that, of course, creates you know, economic problems for the established media. Craigslist, for example, is a big problem for daily newspapers who carry um, d daily advertisements, classifieds. So we haven't seen the end of this yet. But for technology marketing, I personally think it's a very positive and also very exciting development because it's no longer one size fits all really gives you the opportunity to differentiate your products, your companies, your services much better and, and talk to very um, clearly segmented audiences. OK, quick time check. So let me talk about a few case studies where you, know, you kind of see public relations at work. First one is about launching a brand new technology venture. Second one is creating a global brand. And the third one is reviving the brand of a technology leader. On the first one, um, become.com, some of you may know them. They are a shopping and shopping related search site. In Sunnyvale, they, were, they started by um, two entrepreneurs who actually, it's a, it's a second venture, they had started My Simon during the boom, grew it very successfully, and sold it very successfully to CNET. A few years later, they came back because they had developed a, a great new search algorithm and really viewed this as an opportunity to go out and build a new company. 
But at the time, they decided to go public with their message, you know, roughly a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than that. You know, this superior search technology wasn't really all that mature yet. You know, you develop technology, in many cases you don't want to, you can't really wait until all the kinks have been worked out because other people may have entered the space and your technology from a marketing point of view may pretty quickly become obsolete. So they were entering a very crowded space and also a space where they were really appealing to mainstream users, not to other technologists. We were appealing to people who conduct search, um, shopping related searches on the internet. So the strategy, the goal was clear. The goal was to find acceptance for the site and slowly over time grow the traffic to the site. The strategy that was chosen was influencing influencers and in building third party support. If you know a little bit about um, the, the search industry, ever since Google, obviously a massive, massive industry, and there are many different academic approaches out there, there are many different um, ventures out there that focus on search, and hence there are people out there, influencers, who write and, and read and post and blog about nothing but search. Again, thinking about the long tail, they're probably somewhere way down there on the long tail, but they're of course highly relevant to entrepreneurs in the search space. So the strategy was to find those people because those people would understand the promise of this new technology, but they would forgive the entrepreneurs for the lack of maturity at this point in time. The idea was if they went out straight to the media, some, given the lack of support that public relations messages have, some people would have written very negative articles about it, saying like, gee, this is really not that exciting yet. So the idea was to go to these guys, the influencers, and the tactic was to conduct a launch that excluded the media. So it's a very unusual, what I mean with media, mainstream established media, the technology media and, and even some of the you know, business 2.0 type um, you know, venture facing media. And this is, this is a very, it was a high risk to take because you know, most launches, if not all, include you know, talking to the media and the decision that was made there was like, no, we're not gonna do this. We're first gonna build support within our core constituency and then have them talk for us. And what happened, there was a launch event in, in Palo Alto and many of these you know, search specialists participated in it. Many of them were you know, briefed, those who couldn't fly in, were briefed over the phone you know, with, a, with a web demo. Um, and as a result, there was a lot of very positive coverage from these experts. And the first goal was achieved that, and that was that we, there were positive endorsements and traffic started going up. This was the only marketing mechanism used. So you could pretty much directly tie site uh, traffic to um, the success of the, of the public relations program. So it, their goal was to get 10,000 registered users um, in a certain period of time, and that goal was very quickly achieved. Um, they now, of course, have you know, many million um, users, but you know, that was how, how it was when the venture was launched. And then in sort of phase two of the strategy, of the tactic, I'm sorry, of the execution, we then started talking to the media and then we could send the media back to those influencers who we knew would talk favorably about this new technology. Second example, um, Salesforce.com, I would assume many of you are familiar with them. They are in the hosted application space, you know, on-demand space, if you like. And they drove a very strategic and equally aggressive um, public relations campaign that I want to talk about briefly. Interestingly, they were founded in 1999. And 1999 was arguably the best or the worst year for founding a company because the economy was going down rapidly. Um, I think a big part of their success 
can really be attributed to the way they marketed their technology and their brand new venture. Again, this is not necessarily a highly differentiated space they were in. In other words, it was crowded too. There were other competitors. There were established companies like Oracle who are already offering hosted applications and on-demand services. But uh, you know, Mark Benioff, the, the, the CEO of um, Salesforce and his team, uh, I think did an amazing job um, and a very competitive job. So their strategy, the goal was clear. They wanted to put the company on the map. They wanted to win customers. And they wanted to be the number one in um, customer relationship management software. The strategy they picked was, let's take one issue. And the, the one they picked was the supposed end of software. Think about this. The end of the day, they're a software company. And they're out there touting the, the end of software. Well, of course, what they said was, it's no longer about installing, you know, taking a CD and install the software on each PC on every server in the enterprise or in a, in a smaller company. It is about the ability to just go up on your web browser. Everybody has a web browser and you can just click, click, click and you're in this application. So they on purpose kind of twisted this a little bit. It's still software, but they're really saying it's software that you don't need to install on your computer, which in itself is also an oversimplified message because there's still some of that. But Bottom line is they did an excellent job driving this message. They developed these no software buttons, banners. I mean, wherever you went, they would demonstrate, you know, like stage a fake demonstration outside of competitors, headquarters, and trade shows. So in addition to picking one issue, they picked one target, one enemy, being Siebel Systems. And I'm very familiar with that because I was at Siebel Systems. Um, they did a, a very good job, again. And what, what happened, you know, Tom Siebel obviously had built an incredible venture, which at some point, at some point during the downturn had, you know, the stock had, um, uh, had decreased significantly. And as a result, you know, many stakeholders and started speaking up and also many members of the media who had been given Siebel all this amazingly positive coverage during the rise. Well, they weren't as positive about it in the downturn and, you know, there's nothing that Siebel did wrong. It was more that you know, Salesforce saw this opportunity and, and really exploited it quite masterfully. So um, the tactic was really unlimited access to the media. And in fact, um, if you look it up on Google and on, on Forbes, I want to say last month, Mark Benioff actually talked about how he PR'd his technology company and you know, access to, to top journalists has always been one of his absolute priorities. And again, that is something I would like you to think about as you go out and work in companies. There are many entrepreneurs who will say that, you know what, I have my customers to deal with, I have my employees to deal with, my engineers, you know, my investors, I give you one hour a week or one hour a month to do public relations. And you know, that's frequently how it is and sometimes we're able to talk them into doing more. What helped Salesforce.com was really unlimited access to the media. And that is not that they invited the media to talk about anything. They did a very good job always bringing them back to the topics they wanted to talk about, which was no software, was attacking the establishment, which they symbolized at Siebel Systems. And the other tactic they use very successfully is the notion of relevance. If you have great technology, if you are a good marketeer, you talk about it once, twice, three times. At some point, you know, market goes, okay, what else do you have to show? And then you say, well, I have an incremental upgrade to this product, or I have this new partnership. Um, what, what Salesforce did, they just did a very good job at just creating relevance. You know, first way of doing this was talking about the hosted, um, the hosted system, um, software system. They also really talked up the fact that they had a foundation, that a certain percentage of their profits you know, went into a foundation. So they were able to talk about, as a small privately held technology company even, they were talking about corporate social responsibility, which is uh, pretty amazing. It's usually done by, by the large ones, by the Hewlett Packards of the world. Um, so relevance is, is very important, like looking at what is the market really interested in and how can we stay in the news without defaulting back to publicity 
you know, which was, again, something we saw a lot during the, the boom that you know, technology startups would do ridiculous publicity just in order to stay in the news. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being relevant. I, CEO. Yeah, I don't know about this particular example, but I definitely know that there was a technology um, entrepreneur who appeared naked somewhere. It may have been New York City, and that's an example of um, ridiculous um, uh, way of, of going about it. I mean, the idea, the idea was any PR is good PR, and I think that is more true for the celebrities of the world than it is for technology entrepreneurs. Third example I want to give is uh, Sun Microsystems. If you looked at Sun Microsystems about two and a half years ago, they were really in a very difficult situation. You know, Sun, obviously an amazing success story, one of the true technology leaders, and still the technology coming out of them even today is, is amazing. Sun built a great company. They were used to taking risks and, bi bet and big bets, and they did it very successfully. But Again, they seem to be another victim of the, of the economy turning down, the dot-com bust. Their stock price went down very, very significantly. And again, when that happens, everybody starts beating up on you. And media and third-party influencers who like talking to media, including investors, including f employees, they're usually first. Suddenly, everybody's out there, talks very negatively about you. Um, so, the Sun executive team, and of course working with the marketing and also the public relations team, they did, made a very good decision in my opinion. They really decided to change the game. If you're one of these cycles where something really goes wrong, stock price going down, product having bugs and, and, and you're getting, being beaten up about it, the lesson really learned, not just for Sun but for all of these companies, you cannot really fight this avalanche coming up you coming down onto you. You know, in, in a way, the harder you fight, the tougher it gets. So what Sun really did, they, as much as they did a great job containing negative stories, but they really said, let's not worry about that too much. Let's instead change the game and change the discussion. And they had a very, um, they had a great opportunity that presented itself, and it was one of those situations where the timing was just absolutely right. About a year and a half ago, as you remember, the oil price started going through the roof, and at the same time, the discussion about greenhouse gas emissions and global warming really picked up. It's now, I mean, not a day passes without that being a major topic in the media, but at the time, a year and a half ago, it, it really had just started. So. Sun, at the same time, had, promote, had developed, and this, again, it goes back to technology leadership, they had developed a new server line working with AMD, which had come out with a new um, semiconductor line, and they had developed servers that significantly reduce energy consumption. Don't quote me on the number, but something like 30%. And if you think about the fact that today, energy is a major, major cost issue for large companies running large data centers. And if you think about the sort of goodwill you can buy with all of your stakeholders, anybody from your employer to your investor to members of the media, in promoting concepts that are good for the environment and good for business, you know, Sun was just there exactly at the right time. So about a year and a half ago, they picked up this, they, I'm sorry, they kicked off this campaign with a thought leadership event um, in the Presidio, and they invited, of course they brought their own executive, Scott McNeely at the time as the CEO, they brought um, important technologists from Sun, but they also invited uh, people from NGOs, environmental um, in NGOs, and uh, really started a debate about what this all means and, and what, what this means for the future of data centers, for the future of energy consumption, for the future of global warming. And this photo here is, as you'll see, is, those are, of course, empty, but those are oil barrels. 
And the sign on there, it's probably impossible to read, it says, the average corporate data center burns through 80 barrels of oil per day. Let's change this. So what they had done, this is all done through public relations, they also supported this very successfully with advertising, but what they'd really done, they started to change the discussion. The goal was to let those who want to keep talking about our stock price being down, it's just no news anymore, it's been down for a while, let them do what they are doing. We instead are focusing on the future and we're being thought leaders and we're being technology innovators. So um, the, the tactics range from this, this kickoff event to bread and butter media work where you just go out and, and talk to the media about the importance of energy issue. And this is where you can you know, reach very, very high into publications you know, that are being read all over the US and, and frequently outside of the United States. And you can really spark a very high level um, discussion about it. You can write contributed articles even to publications like the Wall Street Journal if you, if you talk as a large company on those issues. And um, in addition, you know, they engage very successfully with, with social media on the topic. As you can imagine, you know, there, there are many social media that really care very deeply about this. Um, they wrote about it on Jonathan um, Schwartz's blog, very, very well-read blog. I highly recommend you, you check it out. You know, he spoke about it, and really this discussion took off and, in, in my opinion, really built a foundation for Sun being under less pressure and really building a foundation for, for a turnaround. And if you've read their coverage more recently, a lot of it is actually very, very positive across the board. So with that in mind, um, I want to leave you with a few takeaways. And the first one, very important for technologists to understand is the best product does not always win. You know, it is maybe unfortunate, but it is so. And this is something I would really want you to, to think about as you go out there and, and, and work at technology companies. Of course, make sure the technology is great because technology really gives you the core ability to win. If you have real bad technology, well, you, you can't. But if you have the best technology, don't assume you win. So pay attention to the other disciplines outside of you know, product development, outside of R&D, that will determine the success of your company. I would go as far as saying that marketing your technology through public relations and through other means is just as important as developing it. You need to make sure that people know about it you need to make sure that the right people know about it, and you need to have a very strategic approach, one that is based on deep analysis of your audiences. You really need to understand, who am I selling to? You know, what does this, person day, uh, this person's day look like? Um, what is his or her job description? What are the things that keep them up at night? So you need to be very market focused in what is, where is this technology actually going and what problems is it gonna help solve? It's important to be truly strategic at it. There is, I think, a, a, a great need for that. And the um, executives and entrepreneurs that I've worked with um, who've really been successful have been the ones who sort of play mental chess about market dynamics um, in their spare time because we all know they're busy the way it is. And they also are the ones who surround themselves with uh, strategic advisors and uh, are willing to go out there and uh, take a leadership position. Keep in mind that publicity is at best short-lived for technology, and you may actually end up spending a lot of time, a lot of effort in useless stunts. Um, really default to strategy as much as you can. And then really the last takeaway you know, small budgets can actually buy you a lot. You know, don't be intimidated by, oh my God, what is this gonna cost? 
if you're very goal oriented, if you're very realistic in what you're trying to achieve and the resources you can put against it, you'd be amazed how little you can do in, in marketing on smaller budgets. And again, public relations is a very good vehicle for this because you can do as little as you know, working with one consultant or hiring one person and just execute against it. Make sure you give it your own personal time and attention. And make sure you're open to being educated um, and trained in it. And keep in mind that it's uh, not always the multi-million dollar PR campaigns that win. With that in mind, um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes, please. So for a small startup, would you recommend that they do their own PR or hire a firm? And if they're going to hire a firm, um, how expensive is something like that cost? Is yeah. So the question is, for a smaller startup, would, would, it, would I advise hiring a firm or doing in-house public relations? And if I hire a firm, what's the investment you're looking at? And my answer is, we've been most successful as an agency working with startups that had somebody in-house who really understood public relations. So whether that person does it as a full-time function or has had, a, has had public relations experience in previous jobs, not as important. Um, but you need to make sure there's somebody in there. And, and many startups invest in this function a little bit too late. Make sure you don't invest too early. Don't invest into marketing when, if you're not ready to talk. But once you're ready to talk, you need to make that investment internally. And then if you then hire sort of, if you like, the, the execution team internally, well, if you think about that, it actually the costs add up pretty quickly. Um, you, know, you will have certain spikes, let's say a trade show you go to, no product rollout, where you need more than one internal person anyway. And then there may be times when things are really not that busy, but you have people on payroll. So what many, age, what many technology startups do is that once they're past their first round of funding, and of course once they're ready to talk about their products and services and not before, that they will hire somebody in, inside who either does PR full-time or part-time, part of the marketing mix. And then you go out and work either with external PR con consultants, individual, individual consultants, or you go out and hire a firm. And if I had to put a price tag on this, um, you can start with probably with smaller consultancies or, or individual consultants at something like three to $5,000 a month. Um, or you retain agencies that tend to start, depending on what agency they are, at five, seven, ten thousand dollars a month. You can also do projects. You can also say, here's just a big company introduction we have, and here's a certain budget we have for that. And afterwards, you don't want to go dark, but you can say, okay, now we're maintaining sort of a lower level up to the next spike. Yes, please. I'm sorry, the last part, how useful is what? Okay, so the question is, how do you educate yourself about um, public relations and how useful would an MBA be? To answer the second part of the question first, if you look at most MBA programs, public relations is not yet really part of it. And that is an area that public relations is very much aware of. Um, public relations as a function, as a business critical function, is really growing up. And um, you know, there are uh, people I know at Wharton who um, teach about it and, and recognize the fact that PR didn't used to be really a boardroom issue, a CEO issue, but it now has earned its place at the table and, and really has a lot to give to a, um, to, to a company. So, MBA in that respect, unless you know, there are some MBAs um, that, that focus more on corporate communication, public relations, most of them probably do very little about it. How do you educate yourself? Well, there are, um, every great university has you know, public relations um, schools you know, where you can attend lectures. But I also think there's just very good reading that's out there. And uh, where you might want to start is do some reading about strategic marketing and to understand the concepts first 
because there are lots of articles and books out there that are really almost too detailed about how to write a press release, how to do certain things that you, as non-PR practitioners, will probably never really get involved in. So I would look at some uh, publications about um, strategic marketing in, in technology. Right. So the question is, what is the right timing for a startup to engage in, in public relations activities? Do you need to have a certain number of customers? Do you need to have products? You know, what's the right timing? And I would say, in most cases, you don't really want to engage before you're ready to roll out your products and services. I'm saying in most cases, because in some cases, especially if you're an innovator, if you're in a new category, if you're creating something that nobody else has, there's immeasurable and incredible value in being out first, in being out there, putting a stake in the ground and saying, here is where the future of this particular technology is going, and we're leading it. If you do that level of thought leadership, public relations, you don't necessarily need a product, but you also need to be aware that you need to talk about this in very conceptual terms, and that you need to have some people backing you. This could be academics, could be um, investors, it could be some very early beta customers who are you know, ready to kind of view beyond, beyond your limitations, are ready to talk about this now. Just very recently, we were approached by a technology startup that said, you know, we're ready to work with an agency. Are you interested in talking to us? We went in for meetings, and we tested their products. And we came to the conclusion and told them that we think the timing is wrong. If you go out now, you know, at a point where you have some non-paying beta customers for a new software offering, if you go out now, basically, commit two mistakes. First one is you spend a lot of money for no or in fact negative return. But secondly, and arguably more importantly, you go out there and you really set the wrong expectations with those people, those opinion leaders, who in the future will be invaluable to the success of your companies. That is, if you go out, and in this particular case, they wanted us to business media tour, if you go out and meet with Fortune, Forbes, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, and you have an offering that then no paying customers are supporting, that is, endorsing to the journalist, if it's an offering that the journalist can play with and, and, and sees limitations, well, you, know, you get exactly one shot. And if that's the case, you probably just um, really wasted an opportunity that you should have waited to maximize a few months later. So in short, my advice is, unless it's a big thought leadership play, wait until you have a solid beta program, wait until you have some customers who are ready to talk to endorsers, and talk to other influencers first before you go out there and open up yourself to public scrutiny. My question is, many times reporters are on guard to the techniques which you're talking about. And this is, to some degree, this happens for the whole class. But what happens is, if, if you want to use the press 
to describe something that you're doing, a product or so forth, and you want to leverage that press coverage later through some advertising or to be able to say that we were, we were in the Wall Street Journal, whatever. Most reporters are on guard to this already. And, and so as soon as they sense that you're self-serving or that you're talking about something of your interest as opposed to the interest of readers or, the, or whatever, they, they would have a tendency to, to try to back off or, or to slow down. What techniques would you suggest to overcome that? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. So the question is, what techniques to use to overcome um, cynicism of, of, of journalists who think you're basically a shameless self-promoter. And I, I think what's really important is that this, what you're describing, actually happened a lot during the dot-com boom. And you had lots of companies out there who you know, spoke to many, many media about big grand ideas and business plans. And many of them received incredible media coverage. And as those companies went up in flames, you know, that really didn't serve those journalists who had been out there endorsing, you know, pets.com and, uh, you know, you name it, other, you know, real high profile um, companies that failed. So what you're seeing now is that the media has become even more cynical about how you conduct outreach and the scrutiny. And so the level of proof that you need to provide is much higher than it, it's ever been. So how do you get around that? And I think most importantly is, you know, be honest and be transparent. Don't promise something that just doesn't exist. Don't promise that your new product does something that it, that it can't do. Because they will find out. I, they may find out before they write the story. Or worse, they'll find out afterwards. And then you've created an enemy for your company. Um, so it's very important to be honest. It's very, open to, it's very important to be transparent. Transparency, again, ever since Enron, ever since blogging, arguably ever since Linux, has become a major, major issue in technology. So what that means is be the first one to point out a limitation. Rather than trying to smooth it over, you know, point it out and explain to the reporter how you're trying to address it. And the third aspect is, and that's very important, you really need to look at it through the eyes of the person who you want to cover this story. What does this person want to get out of it? You know, what motivates a journalist to write? What might demotivate them? What limitations might exist? And this is, of course, where you know, public relations professionals can advise you a great deal. At the end of the day, what media cares about most is news. They want to write a story, ideally, that they're the first ones to write. Or if they're not the first ones, they certainly don't want to be the second wave. So we always need to think about, is this newsworthy? And is it newsworthy for the audience of this reporter? You know, something that can be very newsworthy to a technology trait is absolutely not newsworthy to mainstream business media or financial media. And the last and final point is, it's also very much about relationships. And relationships in the sense that, you, know, you want to show that you add value to a reporter's work and not just, hey, I'm out there with my, with my product. I want a story now. It's more think about long term. Think about you know, how you can be maybe a valuable source to this reporter in the future. Think about how you might help them sort of avoid mistakes. Maybe they're trying to write about something that you as a technologist understand better and say, listen, this is really not the way to look at this particular issue. So, Engage with them, spend time with them, and win and earn their trust. All right. Okay, last question. And then we have it. Are the world's no, advertising ten minutes to answer? All right. <laughs> Twenty seconds. Are the worlds of advertising and the worlds of PR completely separate or does PR encompass advertising? Like as a new startup, would you go to a PR firm in addition to like an advertising agency? Yes. So the question is how separate public relations and advertising are. And for the most part, yes, they're very separate. Um, it, so public relations firm, there are always exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, public relations firm do public relations, and advertising firms do advertising. There are some integrated firms, but then you have business divisions that still are pretty different in itself. So 
what I would recommend is um, you go to specialists in each area, also because they're approaching audiences from a very different angle. One's trying to persuade, the other one's trying to place.